Um, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our second CLSA webinar of 2017. Uh, we're going to get started. It's 12 uh, noon, and we want to make sure that we have as much uh, time um, possible for questions after this webinar. My name is Ine Woben. I'm the Managing Director of the CLSA, and I will uh, facilitate and moderate the webinar today. Uh, for some of you who have not attended a webinar before, um, after the webinar and the presentation, you can type your questions in the chat function, and I will um, present those questions to the speaker at the end to provide answers to your question and if there are multiple questions in advance my apologies if we cannot get to all of them but we will follow up on all your questions after the webinar if they're not addressed so uh, with this I want to uh, introduce dr. James Nasru who will be speaking today uh, James is a professor of sociology and the director of the Center of Dynamics of Ethnicity and co-director of the Manchester Institute for Collaborative Research on Aging at the University of Manchester. He is uh, the principal investigator of the F-Rail program, an interdisciplinary study of inequalities inequalities in later life, and as well co-principal investigator of ELSA, which is a multidisciplinary panel study of those aged 50 and older. So today in the webinar, Dr. James Nasru um, will be presenting um, data from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging to empirically examine the influence of socioeconomic inequalities on transitions and outcomes in later life. So with that, I'm going to give the floor to James. OK. Um, I think I can hear myself. Um, is it working OK? Yes, everything is good. We can hear yeah. you. Yeah, OK, good. It's just turning on the microphone uh, mute button. Uh, I wasn't sure I was working. I was working. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, give this talk. It is a great pleasure to um, uh, to be able to do this and to be able to do it by webinar, which means I can sit comfortably in my office in uh, in Manchester. Well, comfortably, it's raining and um, uh, miserable weather outside, but nevertheless, comfortably in my office in Manchester, rather than flying over to uh, uh, Canada to give this talk, which is good. As you can see, um, uh, the title of my talk is um, around inequalities in later life. Uh, and so the focus is on inequality, and particularly inequality in relation to class and processes of retirement. Though not entirely, I will kind of flag up other dimensions of inequality. But um, here, I, I think the center of my argument is that socioeconomic inequalities related to class are crucial in terms of um, understanding experiences in later life. We'll see, I've switched the subtitle to a view from England. That's simply because of space and attractiveness of slides to have put in um, findings from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. that have just ruined the layout of my slides, so I, I, I've shortened it. Maybe I should have shortened the title more generally. Um, this is not a, a specific research paper. Rather, it's a collection of various pieces of evidence that I and my colleagues have been uh, marshalling in a range of research papers in order to present this broader argument around um, class and um, retirement uh, and inequality in, in later life. So it's not a simple um, research paper as such. And the structure I'm going to follow is um, summarized in uh, this slide. So um, I'll start off with, and perhaps concentrate most on this section in relative time compared with the others, describing a, a context for the work um, that we've been doing. So in effect, how policy responses to the aging of our populations have neglected the question of inequality, uh, and how and why we might we should be thinking about aging differently, particularly in relation to inequality, but also particularly in relation to um, important cohort shifts and period shifts in how we might think about aging. I'll then say something about um, health inequalities in later life. You'll see from the uh, talk that I give that um, when I talk about inequalities, I do embrace the kind of various steps of inequality that um, operate across uh, people's life. But I use health inequalities as a in effect, ultimate marker of the consequences of processes of inequality. So I will say something about um, the significance of health inequalities in later life and how and why we should concentrate on uh, health inequalities in later life. 
Then kind of returning to the theme of how aging might or might not be changing and how patterns of inequality might or might not be changing, I'll spend a little bit of time talking about compression and morbidity and whether we are seeing evidence for this and what that means for inequalities uh, in later life. I'll then say something about the process of aging. Uh, the, I'll then say something about the process of aging, um, age-related um, transitions and how they relate to inequality, uh, and in particular inequalities around well-being. I'll, they, I'll then say something very specific about. I'll, I'll, I'll say something about the very specific um, uh, transition of retirement and how that relates to inequalities. And then I'll move to concluding by saying something about the importance of class and how class might operate in later, later life. And then some summary comments about the findings from our research program and what that means for policy. OK. Um, so. Let's just start off by um, uh, discussing uh, an aging world. And here I'm going to say at least in part some things that you will um, uh, be very familiar with. Um, the arguments, um, uh, I think anybody doing policy work or research work in the field of aging um, will be very familiar with these arguments. This is a quote from the Commission on Global Aging, which reported in 1999. So it gives you some sense of the um, period over which um, uh, we have been concerned about the process of um, uh, demographic aging. Uh, and um, most, most important, I guess, from the 1999 perspective is the focus on Japan, Europe, and the United States. Canada and other developed uh, countries are ignored, of course, here. But mo also importantly, less developed countries are ignored here. And we know that aging is an issue for um, all countries around the world. So it's a global issue. And the argument in this quote um, is um, uh, this notion of preserving economic security. To preserve economic security in the context of rapid aging, um, unprecedented change, we must adapt the social institutions built around it to these new realities. And you can see in the blue boxes that I have on this slide um, the uh, various commentators um, reporting uh, on, on the crisis that we're facing. Uh, and this is um, uh, almost like the language that we see around um, uh, global warming, climate change, a real sense of a major problem uh, facing uh, societies. And the nature of that problem is kind of framed in this uh, kind of in, in this way. Again, the Commission on Global Aging. Um, uh, uh, I, sorry, I took these points again from the Commission on Global Aging. So the concern about reduced labour supply as population ages decreased consumption, reducing tax income, and what that means for the public purse, increased costs of pensions, of health and social care programs, and again, what that means for the public purse, enormous pressure to reduce benefits in order to cope with this, to raise taxes in order to cope with this, and to reduce spending on other public services in order to cope with this, and then reforms of pensions and uh, other forms of benefits, and um, increasing reliance on informal care. Um, in order to um, provide um, good care for older people. As I say, this was, really, this was highlighted very um, significantly in 1999 and since 1999, but I think it's really over, only over the last decade that we've seen significant policy moves to begin to address the aging of our population. And those have really been focused around this question of extending working lives concentrating on people who are leaving work before um, a state pension age and trying to keep them in work, and also on extending state pension age or retirement age in, uh, into later in life. So in the UK, we've seen a move to 67, likely to see a move to 68 pretty soon, um, a very rapid move for women from 60 to 67, and a slower move for men from 65 to 67, and as I say, likely to move on to 68. And alongside that, an active aging policy agenda where the potential of an um, underemployed older population um, to do a whole range of things to help support social and civic uh, life um, is identified as beneficial both to older people themselves and to broader society. And so the aspiration is to promote active aging. If you're not working, you should be engaged in social activities. And the kind of activities you should be engaged in are grandparenting and so on, and other care activities, or engaged in civic activities such as volunteering. The idea to maximize the potential 
an aging population and minimize the risks of an aging uh, population. But the other thing the Global Commission on, uh, sorry, the Commission on Global Aging said, and this has been slightly neglected, in fact, probably entirely neglected in, in policy discussions, is to point towards the way in which what it means to be older is changing. So beneath even the daunting physical projections lies a longer term economic, social and cultural dynamic. What it would be like to live in societies that are much older than any we have ever known or imagined. What will it be like to live in these societies? And this is a crucial question, how um, we understand aging, what aging means to us in terms of our own personal identities, but also how we understand our societies as they, as they become um, uh, older. Uh, the place of older people in our societies uh, and the place of younger people, how we think about consumption and so on, and our population um, ages. And I'll give you two examples of that um, drawn um, from the world of art. So this is a painting um, which I spotted in the um, Manchester Art Gallery um, a few years back by uh, Walter Sickert. Um, drawn 1901 to 04, and the painting caught my eye because it is of an older woman, uh, and it contains, of course, um, uh, a depth of meaning, emotion, and so on. In there, the frailty of the older woman uh, can be seen uh, very clearly. But what then struck my eye was the narrative that went alongside it, uh, which I've got on the right-hand side of this slide. And particularly this statement that contemporary critics found this image shocking at a time when it was thought that the elderly should be treated, represented with respect or with sentiment. And then Sickert instead treads a, treads a fine line between complete honesty and brutality. Uh, and um, uh, what this meant for me when I was uh, looking at this was the way in which what we would consider to be a relatively standard portrayal of an older frail, frail person was seen as shocking at that particular time. The way in which we understand aging now um, is quite different from, or the way in which we represent aging now is quite different from how it was represented to, in 1901. Uh, but the ways in which we understand aging is different. And the other more contemporary challenge to the ways in which we think about aging is in this um, photograph. Um, so this is um, uh, Erwin Olaf who is a baby boomer, born in 1959, a late baby, baby boomer. Uh, and here is a picture of a woman, older woman, on an exercise bike, so challenging our stereotypes of physical activity and aging, but also dressed um, uh, in, a, in a sexual way and presenting herself in a sexual way, so in underwear, uh, made up, hair, beautifully done, uh, and so on. So, and high heels, and so challenging a whole set of notions that we might have about aging that were represented in the previous um, uh, uh, picture. And I've emphasized at the bottom of this slide on the right-hand side, again, what I have on the right-hand side is an account of um, uh, Olaf's work. This is, these aren't my words, of course. These are words of somebody who understands art, uh, unlike me. Um, but um, the, the bit that I've emphasized here, he vividly captures the essence of contemporary life. Uh, and here he is trying to capture the essence of how aging might be being transformed with the baby boomer uh, cohort, uh, I would argue, uh, at least challenging our notions of aging in a way that reflects the ways in which contemporary older populations are challenging our notions of aging. So the idea of aging as a kind of fixed um, uh, notion uh, uh, rather than a notion that is, has social meaning and social meaning that transforms over time. Um, is really important in terms of trying to understand policy responses to aging uh, and how we might understand uh, the demography and the challenges of the demography of aging. Related to this, of course, is the question of the third age. Um, so we have seen an extensive literature on the third age now developed over the last 15 years or so, uh, particularly. Uh, and, and the baby boomers is re potentially reflecting a new generation who are experiencing aging in a different way because of the ways in which society is transformed and has been transformed by baby boomers. So the idea that there's this group of people who are post-retirement, post-parenting, but aren't dependent either financially or um, physically, 
uh, or health-wise. Um, they're in a position to be able to contribute to society, so engage in voluntary and community activities, to be engaged in political and civic activities. And you can see how this is informing some of the policy responses to um, uh, aging populations. They're also a group of people who, being baby boomers, are used to consuming and enjoying life, engaged in leisure and pleasure, and dominating the cultural mainstream. So not all the people who are marginal to the cultural uh, mainstream, not all the people who are marginal to consumption. Uh, but rather at the centre of it. And also older people who are engaged in the self-realisation type activity. So self-fulfilment through having a role, having status and having fun. And at the core of this baby boomer notion is a generation liberated from the standardised lives of previous cohorts. So that instead of making straightforward linear transitions through the life course, rather they're disrupting the life course in various ways. And in this particular instance, disrupting um, uh, old, the, the life course in terms of older life in, in particular ways. Of course, we also see, and this is a particularly dominant theme in uh, the UK and perhaps in Europe more generally, uh, but also emergent in North America as well, this notion of um, greedy, self-interested baby boomers. So those who took advantage of social welfare, post-Second World War social welfare, um, who are self-interested, living individualized lives, orientated to self-satisfaction. And also, um, by being a privileged generation, uh, generating the risk of intergenerational conflict. And this is one of the dominant narratives that we face. But what's hidden in the photographs that I've shown you so far, and in this presentation of what the third age might be, and also in discussions of intergenerational conflict, is the question of class. And so the idea that the opportunity to be a third ager, to have the resources to be a third ager, relate very strongly to dimensions of inequality and particularly to socioeconomic position and class. And you can see this, um, and this is my final slide of introduction, you can see this in this um, uh, comparison of pictures uh, that I have here. Again, drawn from the UK context and the one in right drawn from the Manchester context. Manchester is very proud to be an age-friendly city, one of the first age-friendly cities, uh, and a whole set of cultural um, activities organized uh, within the city to try and make it a more age-friendly place, a place that is good to grow older in. And one of the things that we've done, you can see the date here is 2008, but it's something we've done, um, I think, probably from around 2005 and continuing to do, is to hold festivals and cultural activities around um, uh, the older population. And here we have this image of this kind of vibrant, um, young-looking uh, baby boomer, um, again, out enjoying life, contrasted with the image on the left, which again is an old image from 2005, uh, when discussions around um, uh, extending state pension age to 67 uh, were in full flow. Uh, and a picture of an old woman, frail woman with a frame, uh, walking with a frame, uh, coupled with a story that was about um, older people having to work to the age of 67 before they got a state pension. And I think what, what we have here in these contrasting models, I, I think these two pictures do reflect contrasting models of aging that, that um, uh, we have. And I think what we have in these pictures is not just age and age difference, but we also have class and class difference. And I'll try and illustrate that now with the more empirical parts of my uh, presentation. So I'll move on to the second part of my um, talk, which is about the significance of health inequalities in later life. And here I will show you, those of you who have done stuff on socioeconomic inequalities, I'll show you stuff that you may well be uh, familiar with. But my focus here really is on socioeconomic inequalities in later life, not socioeconomic inequalities more broadly. And the first slide I show you is from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. Sorry, I should have said, I'm not going to introduce the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. Um, uh, you had a brief introduction um, uh, to it from, um, in a, uh, at the beginning of the um, uh, uh, presentation, but I won't describe it. But if you do have questions on it, I'll be very happy to talk about its design and so on. So this is survival rates um, in the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. 
uh, stratified by wealth for uh, people aged 50 plus. And what we have here are six year is, is a six year period and the proportion of people who remain alive over that six year period. And um, you can see for women, the top line is the richest fifth of people, the bottom line is the poorest fifth of people, with the other three lines being the other three quintiles in um, order. And after six years, you can see that just over 96% of women um, were alive at the end of those six years in the richest uh, quintile. Whereas for the poorest quintile, um, that number was closer to 84%. So I don't know if you can see my point a bit, if you can, it's now at the 84% for the poorest and now at the approximately 96% for the richest. A massive gap. And you can see exactly the same for men on the right hand side of the chart. Um, very um, stratified by wealth differences in survival rates with large gaps between the richest and poorest quintiles. And remember, these are quintiles of the population. So these aren't absolute measures. These are relative quintiles of the population, um, which I think makes these differences more significant. And if you do a survival model um, where you take into account things like health behaviors, pre-existing uh, chronic conditions, education, uh, and class, then these wealth differences are still very large, as you can see from the number right at the bottom of the chart, 1.7, a hazard ratio of 1.7. So this is significant differences in survival in midlife onwards. Um, and these differences exist into the oldest ages. And this is what this chart um, attempts to show you. So what I have here are cross-sectional data showing the association between fair or poor self-reported health rather than good or excellent self-reported health and wealth. Um, men on the left this time, women on the right, and on the left of each of those are younger people, age 50 to 59, and older people, age 75 plus. And you can see for each group a clear gradient um, from the richest quintile on the left-hand side of each of these blocks to the poorest quintile on the right-hand side of each of these blocks. What is important here is that the data for those age 50 to 59 is very well known, but to remember that these inequalities are present in the oldest age groups as well. And some of the other work we've done shows that in fact these are an underestimate of the inequality in later life because they don't account for mortality differences. If you model in mortality into differences into this, these slopes become much steeper um, at older ages. But nevertheless, at older ages we still see these inequalities. And just to show you the size of the difference between the different um, wealth groups, these red circles show you that the level of health for the poorest three quintiles, sorry, for the richest three quintiles, for both men and women in the 70 plus age group, so the first three bars in the 70 plus age groups, is equivalent to the health level, in fact, probably better than the level of health for the poorest two quintiles in the 50 to 59 year old or old age group. So dramatic differences in health across those groups as well as gradients um, uh, within the groups. So that gives you a kind of illustration of the extent of socioeconomic inequalities in, in health, both in terms of survival and uh, morbidity. Um, and we see this for a whole range of um, health outcomes, of course. Um, but just to remind you, I said it very briefly in my introduction, just to remind you, of course, of socioeconomic position, wealth, education and so on, all reflections of class are not the only important indicators of um, inequality. There are others. Uh, and here I give you a very brief illustration um, from uh, England in relation to um, ethnicity. And so if you look at the right hand side of this chart, I won't go into detail on this chart, but if you look at the right hand side of this chart, you can see the differences in later life between different ethnic groups are really very, very marked. Bangladeshi represented by the red line, white English represented by the black line, the size of that gap, and the way in which that gap has extended across these age groups and for the other ethnic groups, ethnic minority groups included here, um, shows in later life ethnic inequalities are really very dramatic in, in the UK. And you can think of other dimensions of inequality that are also important, I won't illustrate, such as gender and where people live area. 
Instead, I'm going to move on to talk about compression and morbidity and inequality. And the question here really is about whether the inequalities that um, uh, we are seeing might be reducing as a consequence of compression or morbidity. And the notion of compression and morbidity, of course, is very important to our understanding of um, aging and the implications of um, the aging of our populations. If aging is being driven by increasing survival rates, which of course it is, as well as reduced fertility rates, but in increasing survival rates. So if it's being driven by increasing survival rates, then we would hope, that along with increasing survival rates, we also see increasing health and reducing dependency um, and, um, uh, and therefore reductions in um, need for health and social care. That would be a good news story. What would be an even better news story would be, of course, if, those, if that compression of morbidity is occurring at a differential rate uh, between um, richer and poorer people so that the significant morbidity that I've just shown you being faced by poorer people is being reduced um, rapidly. And so this is what I want to show you. And I want to show you this in relation to, or whether this is happening is what I want to show you. And I want to show you this in terms of um, frailty. So what I have here is uh, not data, but um, a, a kind of image of what um, I'm going to be showing you, which is slightly complicated. So I just show you, just guide you away through it. So what I have here are two cohorts, um, a cohort that is more distant, who, were, who, will become, who became 70 in 2002-03, and a more recent cohort in red. So the blue cohort, cohort of the older cohort, the red cohort of the more recent cohort would become 70 in 2010-11. And the red line and the blue line represent the growth in level of frailty as these cohorts get older which of course we would expect to see. And if there was no difference, if there was no compression of morbidity, then we would expect the lines to overlap. So at the age of 70 and where there are overlapping lines, uh, overlapping ages for these two cohorts, as observed, they have the same level of frailty. And the rate of change in level of frailty within the cohort to be the same. So the slope of each of these lines is the same, both the slope and the level at a particular age group are the same. This, of course, would not be a particularly good news story. It would be an OK story. We don't see, with increasing uh, survival, we don't see a compression of morbidity. What we would really like to see is this. So at the age of 70, the more recent cohort, the red line, is at a lower level than, it, than the blue line, the more distant cohort. Lower levels of frailty at the age of 70 for more recent cohorts. And also importantly, the slope of that line is shallower. So the rate of increase in frailty with age is smaller. This would imply much lower levels of dependency and morbidity for 70-year-olds for more recent cohorts, of course. We may see something that is not optimistic, but something that is pessimistic, which is this. And here, the two lines are in the opposite um, level. So more recent cohorts have higher levels of frailty and increasing rates of frailty in comparison with the more distant cohorts. So this is the kind of model that I'm going to show you. And this is the actual model. So here are the actual data. Frailty trajectories by cohort. So each of these lines is a specific birth cohort observed from a specific age um, for an eight year period um, within the English Longitudinal Study of Aging. And confidence intervals around the estimate of the level of frailty in each of these. And if you look at the middle part of this graph, you can see that the lines overlap and grow at the same rate. The suggestion is that the level of frailty is the same for each of these cohorts at a particular age group and will continue to be the same over time. But if you look at the right hand side of this graph, you see a rather different picture. What it seems here is that the more recent cohorts have higher levels of frailty at a particular age point, as this blue circle suggests, than more distant cohorts. More recent cohorts have higher levels of frailty than more distant cohorts suggesting an expansion of morbidity rather than a compression of morbidity. This is a really important um, lesson. We haven't replicated this in any other studies yet. Um, we may not be able to, of course, but from the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, this is a really important message about um, the risks of aging populations. If you stratify that analysis by wealth, you see this. And there are two things to say about this chart. The first are the two red lines. 
which show that the level of frailty for a relatively young cohort for the poorest third of the population is the same as the level of frailty for a relatively old cohort for the richest third of the population. This is the inequality that I've already shown you. But importantly, this expansion of morbidity, the higher lines for the more recent cohorts, is occurring in the poorest third of the population and not really in the richest third of the population. So expansion morbidity is strongly related to socioeconomic position. Okay, I'm now going to move on uh, and talk about age-related transitions and well-being. And so here I want to do a couple of things. The first is to actually show the relationship between age and well-being. And second, to try and explain that. And so this is the pattern that I think many of you will have already seen. Um, that uh, U-shaped relationship or inverted U if you're measuring positive well-being. Here I'm measuring negative well-being, so depressed mood. So this is a depression score. Uh, U-shaped relationship with age. So as the population heads towards their mid to late 60s, their well-being improves, and then in their um, late 60s onwards, their well-being deteriorates. And we show this in a longitudinal model um, uh, as well as cross-sectionally. If you look at this by wealth, then you actually see the age effect is present for all wealth groups. So the poorest group are neatly stratified above the next poorest and the next poorest and the next poorest to the richest. Uh, so this U-shaped relationship is present for each of the wealth groups. What's important here to recognize is that wealth is really important for people's wealth, well-being across the life course, but it's not explaining uh, this age relationship. So what's explaining this age relationship? And in fact, it's a couple of very simple things. So here is the age relationship, controlling for gender and ethnic differences. Um, here is what happens when you control for marital status. The line, the sharp rise in the line that happens post-70 becomes much shallower, doesn't rise very much. This is entirely a consequence of widowerhood or widowhood. So spouses dying um, drives a lot of that rise in negative well-being um, in later life. And this is what happens when you control for health. A very positive story for those of us who are, who are heading into our uh, 60s, 70s, uh, 80s, your well-being um, should continue to improve just as long as you maintain your health and your spouse, uh, spousal relationship is maintained. This, of course, is not, um, sorry, the, the two events of deteriorating, deteriorating health and your spouse dying are not randomly distributed in the population. These are events that happen to poorer people more often than richer people or at earlier ages than richer people. So this neat line decreasing over time, oh sorry, decreasing over age, of course, is something that we can't all um, aspire to. Something that none of us in the end will aspire to, of course, but nevertheless is something that those of us who are in richer positions are more likely to achieve than uh, those of us in poorer positions. Okay, having made that point, I now want to focus on this particular, sorry, let's just, just slip back a slide. This particular area, um, a couple of slides, this particular decrease, decrease in negative well-being, so, so this improvement in well-being that's happening um, leading up to, the, leading up to um, mid to late 60s, and what might be driving that. And what might be driving that, of course, is the transitions around um, work and retirement. Uh, and what I want to do here is to show you um, uh, the implications of extending working lives. So does getting people to work for longer in their lives improve their well-being? And then the implications of retirement. What happens when we retire in relation to our well-being? And so can we explain some of that U-shape um, uh, by looking at transitions out of work? I won't show you that slide because I'm not going to go through all of that detail. So the first thing I want to do is to show you what happens if you keep on working. And here we've attempted to do some causal modeling using um, 
propensity score matching, so to match people who are equivalent in all characteristics apart from the fact that they continue to work post-retirement um, age. And here I show changes in levels of depression, levels of self-rated health, and levels of cognitive function um, for those who continue to work post-retirement age compared with those who retire. And what you can see from the I-bars, which show confidence intervals, there is no meaningful change. There might be a bit of a change in cognitive function, but the confidence intervals there are very wide. There's no meaningful change for depression or self-rated health. It looks like um, continuing to work after retirement doesn't impact on your health. But there are two types of work that people do post-retirement. And what I've done here is to contrast those people who work in good quality work compared with those who work in poor quality work. People continue to work post-retirement either because they enjoy working or because they have to work for money. And this is an effect those in low quality work who have to work for money contrast with those in good quality work who are enjoying their work and continue to feel they have something to contribute. And here I show changes in depression score, self-rated health and cognitive function again. And you can see for cognitive function, the bar is a little bit higher, but the confidence intervals are impossibly wide for me to make any strong assertion about that. But what you can see is that both depression and self-rated health get worse for those, uh, sorry, get better for those in high quality work compared to those in low quality work. So it's not working post-retirement age that's important. It's not working in later life that's important, but the kind of jobs that we have. And you get a similar message in relation to retirement. What I've done here is contrasted retirement routes. So compared with people who retire at state pension age, who say, I've got to 65 or 60 for women uh, for some of these analyses, um, and retired because I got the state pension and it was time to retire, compared with those who retire early because they want to, and those who retire early because they have to. So want to is because you want to have more time, you want to spend time with your grandchildren, you want to do leisure activities and so on, and have to retire is because your partner's ill, um, because you've been made redundant, those kind of things. I've got four outcomes here, a bit much to show you, I know, uh, but four outcomes in relation to well-being. <clears throat> and for depression, you can see that if you retire voluntarily, your depression improves compared with those who retire state pension age. And if you retire involuntarily, it deteriorates compared with those who retire um, at state pension age. And you can see the same for life satisfaction on the right-hand side top, <coughs> although the confidence intervals aren't... Um, across one for those who retire voluntarily. You can see the same for quality of life, and you can see the same for social participation. Again, though they cross one for um, those who retire voluntarily. So the crucial messages here are that um, both working and retirement are not uniform experience in later life. Uh, they are patterned by your class position. The argument being that the kind of work you get in later life um, impact on your well-being, but the kind of work is driven by your class position. And the way in which you retire um, uh, relates to your well-being in later life, but the way in which you, re you retire is driven by your class position. So I'll come to my kind of concluding um, uh, sections. I'll be another five minutes or so, I think, um, and talk about class uh, more explicitly now and the importance of class in later life. Now, obviously, I've already uh, made what I believe to be a reasonably strong argument about the importance of class in later life, how it relates to health and well-being, um, how it relates to the things that happen to us in later life, and more specifically, how it relates to our work and retirement experiences in later life, and then how all that impacts on our health and well-being. Um, what I want to do now is just have a discussion or give you a presentation on how we might understand class in, in later life, and, and just show you a few things in, in relation to that. So one of the things that um, colleagues and I have tried to do is to reintroduce class analysis into our understanding of later life. And I think um, 
Uh, over the last few decades, class has um, kind of disappeared, and it's disappeared for a number of reasons. One is because a kind of strong interest in um, cultural gerontology around cultures of aging, and then questions of class have become submerged around questions of cultural practice, which of course relate to class. And the other is because the kind of inequalities in health literature has largely neglected later life. And there are a number of reasons why both these things have happened. And, and one is because when we do empirical research, we typically operationalize class with measures of occupation and occasionally with measures of education. And so then the focus is inevitably going to be on those of working age. And when we do that, we kind of theorize class in terms of the impact of labor position on material and psychosocial factors which then impact on relevant health-related outcomes. And you can think of the work of people like Richard Wilkinson, Michael Marmot, and so on, in terms of that, uh, um, David Blaine, Mel, Mel Bartley, where the material circumstances driven by class position may impact on our outcomes, but also the psychosocial stresses that relate to our class position might impact on our outcomes. And of course, the psychosocial focus has been very much on work conditions. Uh, so control, autonomy, and effort reward in work, um, and how that impacts on uh, our health outcomes and on relative social positions, so how people position themselves or perceive their position in society and how that impacts on uh, their outcomes. And in both cases, again, the emphasis has been very much on working age populations. And of course, a lot of this work has also been done on men um, uh, rather than women. So the ways in which the conditions of our life control and autonomy and effort reward type measures might apply to other dimensions of our life has not really been greatly considered in this empirical work. Um, part of my argument, which is reflected in the cultures of uh, gerontology type literature, is that, but also in the kind of traditional um, sociological literature around class, is that occupational class and education to actually adequ adequately capture stratification in societies um, uh, in, in in, in contemporary societies where consumption and practice are particularly important. So the things we do, the um, cultural forms we consume, um, the ways in which we live our life become increasingly important markers of our class position, of our status. So this, of course, builds on the work of Bourdieu and those who have followed Bourdieu, but basically arguing that markers of social and cultural capital are important. And my argument is that this may be particularly important for those post-retirement where their occupations um, may have less direct salience, rather the ways in which they live their lives might be much more important in terms of understanding their position in society. We've tried to empirically investigate that um, in a fairly complex model that I've kind of graphically illustrated here. So the detail of the empirical model that's in this paper is not quite the same as the picture, but the picture is what we tried to capture. And here um, we've basically argued that there are three broad but interrelated pathways that impact on health and well-being in later life, uh, so that connect class and education to health and well-being in later life. And one is the material pathway, so wealth, pension, uh, leading to material circumstances, leading to health and well-being, but also operating through social status, so our material circumstances influencing our social status. The other is a psychosocial pathway, which is work and work quality, but also social status more directly, so a direct relationship with social status, impacting on our health and well-being. But third and crucial, um, and perhaps empirically very under-investigated in studies generally, but particularly in studies of later life, are the kind of social and cultural um, dimensions of, of life and how they relate to class, how they relate to material circumstances, wealth and pensions, and how they relate to social status and to health and well-being. And here I'm basically arguing that there are a whole set of things that operationalize through social connections, social roles and participation, cultural practices, and health behaviors in fact reflect social and cultural capital. And that these are important in determining health and well-being either through social status or directly. And we have some empirical evidence to support this model. But I think I would say that this model is at least in part um, theoretical uh, at the moment. But I'll give you just some illustration of how this operates. And I'll do that in terms of thinking about social con connections and social roles and participation and cultural practice and how these might be summarized in a notion of social detachment. So in this slide, 
on the left hand side, so the four first blocks of bars are different dimensions of social detachment and how they relate to wealth. And what you see that for each of these, or for the first three of these, civic, leisure and cultural, there is a very strong wealth gradient in detachment from these dom domains of social life or social and cultural life. For social networks, that's not the case. Um, but for an overall measure that measures being uh, detached um, uh, across these domains, there is again a very strong social gradient. And on the right hand side, you, sorry, a very strong wealth gradient. And on the right hand side, you can see that a longitudinal assessment of risk of becoming detached is also very strongly graded according to wealth. So this is your relative risk of being detached compared with the poorest quintile for the subsequent um, uh, quintiles, and again a very strong gradient, with the richest quintile having a 20 having 20% of the risk of the poorest quintile of being becoming detached over time. And so, and then of course there's an the, the, the extension of this argument would be to show how social detachment relates to um, uh, uh, health and well-being. I'm going to skip over the next slide, which is really just an illustration of how this works in practice. So it's a qualitative piece of data. Um, and instead, say something very briefly again about material conditions and that wealth inequalities are marked in later life. It's not something that we can ignore. It's not just that these quintiles are all nested very close together in, in terms of absolute wealth. They are very, very different mean wealths across them. So what I show you here are deciles of um, the population in terms of wealth. Um, and the, on the left-hand side is the amount of wealth in each of these deciles. And on the right, so the axis on the left, and in the blue numbers at the top are the proportion of total wealth um, owned by each of these deciles. It's important to remember that these are survey data. So they exclude the poorest and exclude the richest who don't participate in surveys. But nevertheless, you can see that two-fifths of the wealth is owned by the richest tenth of the population. And when you add those three numbers together, the top 30% um, thir top of the population, and I should know the number, I've added it together many times, but I don't have it immediately on my head, is um, what 61 plus 12 is it's almost three quarters of the wealth. And the bottom fifth of the population can uh, have almost no wealth at all. So conclusions, and I'll try and go through these reasonably quickly because I'm conscious of time. Um, so here are my concluding comments, and I might just kind of semi-read these out. Um, there are significant class inequalities that continue into later life, and I make the points in this bullet point that we should also be studying ethnic, gender, and area inequalities, where the mechanisms might be different, but they're nevertheless very important inequalities. They're present for all of the outcomes that we can be concerned about, whether these are health and well-being outcomes or ones that are proximal uh, or, or, or uh, to health and well-being. There are important variations by cohort, if you remember the stuff I was showing you on frailty, with a strong indication of increases in levels of morbidity, at the very best stability in levels of morbidity across um, cohorts, but likely to be increases in levels of morbidity across cohorts, a widening of inequalities, and the increases are being driven by the increases amongst poorer people. Um, the kind of transitions that we go through in later life are really important for later life um, outcomes, so marital status, the onset of health and disability, retirement, status and route, and wealth, and all of these are strongly patterned by social class. So this is my argument that social class is really very, very important determining later life outcomes. I tried to show you a little bit of this, that the inequalities that we observe operate through complex and interrelated mechanisms and processes that operate over time. So material well-being, social and cultural capital, employment quality and retirement, and social status and the availability of and um, uh, performance of valued roles and identities. The thing I haven't really emphasized, that though only talked about a little bit at the beginning, I, I guess I did emphasize it a little bit at the beginning, is that we are seeing important cohort and period changes that are reshaping later life. And I showed you that in terms of the representation of later life. But these have also important implications for inequality. So the way occupational structures are changing, the way pension arrangements are changing, retirement choices are changing, the way marriage choices are changing. So the meaning of divorce, for example, will vary dramatically across cohorts and potentially changes in health across cohorts. 
all of these are patterned by class, have implications for class inequalities, and they all have implications for policies to address aging. But these discussions of policy neglect class inequalities. Uh, and my argument here is that we need to address inequalities in later life. And this is my final slide. So my argument now is that socioeconomic inequalities in later life are an absent to topic in policy discussion and development. And I think that is true in most developed countries, um, uh, including in the UK, where we have a strong focus on inequalities, but not on inequalities in later life. There's almost no consideration of inequalities in discussion around questions of extending working lives, around active aging, around pensions, and around social care and welfare reform. All things are very actively being discussed at the moment. Um, almost no interventions to address inequalities in later life. And interventions that are focused on later life, there is no evaluation of their impact on inequalities. Instead, policy discourse and focus is on empowerment of older people, productivity, individualization of risk and responsibility. Think about that in terms of pensions and so on in the context of welfare retrenchment in um, contemporary neoliberal responses to um, discussions around public spending. All of these reforms are likely to increase inequalities. And I would argue, in fact, when we think about the kind of reforms that we are discussing in relation to aging populations, there is a policy space for interventions targeted at reducing inequality and increasing social justice. So when we talk about pensions and pension reform, when we talk about extended working lives and job quality, when we talk about housing, and when we talk about the social roles that we would like active older people to be engaged in, we, all of those discussions could be um, framed by the need to redress inequality. So that was my final point. I will end now, but just this final slide, which you will see, lists a number of colleagues. This, of course, isn't my work. It's the work of a number of colleagues. Um, lists a large number of colleagues who've um, uh, helped me develop um, these ideas. And I will close now. This is an advert, I think, for the next um, uh, session. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nazru. Uh, that was really an excellent uh, presentation where you uh, very uh, well laid out all the challenges and uh, the results of the research from the ELSA. Um, I just want to mention to the participants that if you have any questions, you can please type them in the uh, chat box and I will present them to uh, Dr. Nazru. Um, and uh, while you may be doing that, I just wanted to um, ask you, Dr. Nazru, um, you are um, saying very elegantly that there is a, a space for intervention that has not been addressed yet. So based on your uh, research and your experiences, where do you think would be the biggest impact for intervention right now, understanding that there's multi-factors and uh, multiple influences on um, you know, the impact of such interventions. You already listed a few, such as housing and others, but based on your experience, where do you feel is would be the biggest impact for yeah. intervention? Um, yeah, so, so um, I think the um, biggest impact is in part where you can um, get the opportunity to leave a change and in part where you can uh, leave a change that is effective. And I think we have lots of opportunity to leave a change around pension reform if we can shift the debate. Um, so at the moment, the debate is around the kind of individualization of pension risk, at least in, in Europe and, and, and particularly in the UK. Um, individualization of um, pension um, uh, risk, um, so pension investment and pension risk. And we can see quite clearly, I, I don't need to kind of spell it out how this will amplify inequalities, but actually we thought about pension reform. Um, so the intention is to reduce the costs of pensions or the relative costs of pensions. And if, the, if we think about pension reform in a way that um, redresses income inequality um, post-retirement, then we could do, do so yeah, in, in a way that um, uh, minimizes inequality and reduces spend on pensions. Of course, those of us who are in very good pension schemes, um, uh, like many academics in the UK, would suffer as a consequence, but nevertheless, that would reduce inequalities in a major way. That's one area. I think um, uh, there are many others, um, of course, and, and I tried to list a few where I thought there was some evidence for action. Um, uh, in, in, and housing is one of those, which I didn't talk about at all, but there is some evidence that uh, addressing housing 
and poor housing would make a major difference to the lives of poorer older people. Okay, great. Now, um, and I do um, also know that you know, there's other countries that might have already um, addressed some of these interventions. I'm thinking, for example, in Japan, where they are a little bit ahead of the curve. Um, have you seen any uh, specific um, actions from in different countries that could um, that were effective there and could address these inequalities, for example? Uh, I'm sorry, that's a that's a question that I can't answer without being a, a little bit evasive because I'm sure there will be evidence. So most most of my research is um kind of or where I've looked for evidence, I've kind of focused um to a large extent on the it's been been done in the UK policy. So I'm making excuses. It's been done in the UK policy environment. So I've looked for evidence within the UK. Um, uh, I don't think there is a huge deal of evidence elsewhere. But you can imagine that a good evaluation of some of the things that are happening in Japan, as one example. Um, uh, w would be very useful. And also the ways in which um, later life employment and later life care are being considered differently in different countries might give us um, some important insights. So one of my arguments um, has always been that we need international studies because we get policy variation and then we can look at policy variation to see whether that <coughs> gives us clues on how to um, maximize benefits, minimize inequalities, of course. I've mean, okay. made that argument. I don't. I can't answer that uh, question. No, that's that's okay. I I, uh, I just thought to ask you. Yeah. There, is, a, there is one question from uh, Susan McDaniel, um, who says, uh, "Thank you for a very uh, interesting presentation. Um, do you have any suggestions on how we can create comparable data from less ideal data?" Yeah. So so there there is kind of a set of interesting issues here. Is um. As people may know, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging is a is a family of study is part of a family of studies. So we also have the founding study, the Health and Retirement Survey. Um, we have a set of studies that are very closely related to each other across mainland Europe, entitled Share. We have the um, a Charles study in China. We have the Closer study in Korea. Um, and others, um, and of course um, the Canadian study, which I guess the people in this audience are all very familiar with. Um, and over time, um, we get increasing amounts of longitudinal data from these studies, um, which then enables us to do some of the kind of things that, uh, that I've done. As I've just argued, the international comparative work is really important. So we have done a little bit of work comparing US and UK data, which I haven't shown you, of course. Um, which does point to the importance of um, trying to understand policy variation around healthcare, for example, uh, and achieving good outcomes in relation to healthcare. If there aren't longitudinal data, then I think, and a lot of my work around ethnicity is in this position, where there are, where there aren't good longitudinal data sets in the UK, then, then we're stuck with having to try and develop pseudo cohorts from uh, repeat, repeat cross sections. And that can work to a certain extent. Um, uh, the methodology is complex, um, where you try and basically identify a cohort in one data set and then look at them in a more recent data set and see change over time. And then you can compare different cohorts and, and so on in the kind of way that I did. But there's lots of error in that, of course, and it depends and it requires very careful matching of data. So thinking about the ways in which you can use repeat cross sections to do the kind of stuff that we've done using longitudinal data. And the other area is, is the increasing availability of administrative data, um, including um, government data um, or government generated data across um, uh, countries that enables us to do some of this kind of work. And as I understand in Canada, you're, 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 you have difficult to access, I suppose, but nevertheless very rich on data from your statistical government statistical agency, which can be used to um, uh, um, kind of examine some of these questions. Okay, thank you very much. And of course, there's also the Canadian Longitudinal Study on yeah. Aging, uh, where there is lots of data available now. So I'm shamelessly putting a plug in here for all the attendees to uh, check out uh, our website to see what data we have available. Um, we have come to the end of our seminar now. Um, Dr. Nazaru, thank you so much for a very um, well done presentation uh, to us. Um, so again, thank you very much. And I also want to um, uh, remind everybody that our next uh, webinar will be on March 28th, uh, w which will be presenting data from the Irish Longitudinal Study on Aging by Orna Donoghue. So we hope you can uh, join us then as well. Again, thank you very much, everybody, and especially thanks to you, Dr. Nasru, for your um, wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.